Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for our Tuesday night worship service. And as we uh, begin, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, I ask that as we are joined together this evening to lift up your name and to hear from your word, Lord, I ask that you would be at work in each and every one of us. Even though we cannot be together in person, all in one place right now, Lord, I ask that we would uh, join together in one spirit as we worship you. And Lord, I want to also very specifically ask that you would uh, grant us patience during this time. I know that so many are struggling right now, Lord, um, for so many different reasons, struggling to uh, provide and, and, and acquire the things that they need um, to, to survive right now, Lord, and, and so many of us also uh, growing very frustrated and tired of the circumstances that we're living in right now. And, and God, I just ask that you would grant us patience and peace during this time. Uh, Lord, we know that this is temporary, but uh, it's starting to feel less and less temporary. And so many I know are struggling with anxiety and, uh, and fear. And God, I just ask that you would be at work in us and sustain us through this. And Lord, I ask that that you would be at work in us during this time. As so much of our normal life has been taken away from us, Lord, I ask that you would show us our need of you and that we would find peace and satisfaction in you alone during this time, perhaps in a way that we have never felt before. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You wrote a letter and you signed your name and I read every word of it page by page He said you would be coming, coming for me For the place where I belong, 
I can't wait to join the angels and sing. No, I can't wait to join the angels and sing my heaven song. Good evening. Today, the Sabbath day, is a day of rest. And I want you to think about how you used this day. I hope you worshiped on Sunday morning with us. I hope you tuned in on the internet and, and caught the Sunday morning service. I hope you are also with us tonight, which is service will be aired Tuesday night. But the question I have for you this evening is, did you rest on the Sabbath? Was it a day in which you worshiped and a day in which you rested? God created the Sabbath for us, not us for the Sabbath. Yet many times we don't take advantage of God's gift to us. Two weeks ago, we covered a section in Hebrews where Christ was compared to Moses. I told you that was part one. In part one, we discovered that Christ is superior to Moses in his being, meaning in simply who he is, Christ is superior. Secondly, Christ is superior to Moses in his ministry. Moses was a prophet that told the people what was going to happen. Christ then came along and fulfilled those prophecies. Tonight we're going to cover part two. Christ is superior to Moses in the rest he gives. Christ provides three different kinds of rest for his children. First, he gives us a day of rest every week. He commanded in the Ten Commandments that we remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. God God not only commanded that we rest on the Sabbath day, on the seventh day, but he demonstrated it. God created the universe in six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. The second type of rest is when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord and wholeheartedly commit ourselves to him. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I spent a significant amount of time last Sunday evening discussing the Israelites and the rest they were to experience by entering the promised land. If they were faithful to God, he promised to protect them from their enemies, to provide bountiful crops to them, and also fertile livestock. They were to experience a restful, peaceful time while on this earth. God wants to take us to the same place today. And then lastly is our future rest. Christ is going to take his children home to an eternal dwelling where we will experience peace and rest with him in paradise. The last rest is what we know is heaven and what a place it will be. I'm going to concentrate this evening on Hebrews chapter 4 verses 1 through 13 But I want to back up into chapter 3, and I want to start in verse 16. We'll go through verse 19 and then move straight on in to chapter 4. Chapter 3 sets a context for where we were last Sunday evening, but also gives us a good running start for the passage tonight. And so if you would please follow along with me in Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands... Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. 
But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is in uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Point number one this evening is that let us make sure we believe God's word so we can find our rest. God made a promise that is still in play to this day. He will provide rest for his children who believe in him. The Israelites got to the promised land and missed their rest because they didn't believe God could help them conquer the land. They were saved, but did not believe in God wholeheartedly. Verse 1 of chapter 4 says that the promise of entering his rest still stands. It is through trusting in Jesus Christ on a daily basis that we can have the peace and promise that God is going to provide for us and protect us and meet our needs. What a huge burden that promise lifts from our shoulders. God says in Matthew 6, do not worry. Why? Because if we're trusting in Jesus Christ and living for him, then God says, I will provide. This is our current resting in the Lord. Only when we take God's word and mix it with our faith, can it accomplish its purpose in our lives. The writer makes the following points in chapter 3 and 4. First off, he says that God finished his work and rested, so his work has been available, excuse me, so his rest has been available ever since creation. Secondly, the Israelites failed to enter into their rest. And third, many years later, in Psalm 95, God said that a rest is still available. He used the word in the passage we read tonight to, uh, for the term in quotes, today. That today is still with us. It is still here. It is our day of rest that God has given us. Verse 8 says, if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Moses and Joshua were not able to give the people rest. That only comes through Jesus Christ. Now, just as a side note this evening, if you're reading from the King James Version, then they throw you a slight curve with verse 8. They put the name Jesus in verse 8, and it should be Joshua. Uh, Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua. In my King James, there's a footnote that says Joshua, but you have to go down to that footnote to see that. 
In the New King James Version, it has been corrected, and I think most of the other translations use Joshua. So just know when you're reading verse 8 that it may cause you a little problems if you're reading out of the, the King James Version. When we make a personal commitment to Jesus Christ, we find a salvation rest. We no longer have to worry about where we're going for all eternity. That's taken care of. We have peace with God. And then when we submit to God on a daily basis, we find a different kind of rest. The rest comes from knowing we're choosing the easiest path for our lives. Verse 11 says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. We must trust in God and believe in him and we will find our rest that only Christ can provide. Moses couldn't give that kind of rest. It only comes through Jesus Christ. God doesn't want us to be unsure about where we stand. And so he has provided a way where we can know for sure. He has provided his living word. It is what we call the Bible, our instruction book for life. And so here's point number two this evening is know that God's word is living and active and discerns for us what we believe and where we stand before God. You know, as you read through this passage, verses 12 and 13 seem to come out of nowhere. Uh, at first, I thought that the writer made a mistake and that verses in 12 and 13 were placed in the wrong order or placed in the wrong paragraph or chapter. You know, the writer is talking about rest and about how Christ compares with Moses. And then seemingly out of the clear blue sky comes this passage about God's word and how it uncovers everything. Nothing can be hidden from God and how it judges our thoughts and our attitudes. I want to take you back to the sermon from last week for just a moment. And it talked about having a hard heart, about not believing in God, even as a Christian. And these two verses finish that entire thought. How do you know whether you have a hard heart? Read God's Word. Spend some time in it. The writer here is telling us the Bible is like a sword. The Greek word used here refers to a short sword or a dagger. And the Bible says it is like a dagger that is thrust into your body and it lays bare your thoughts and attitudes before God. Nothing can be hidden. If you have a hard heart, it will be exposed. God gave us this instruction book so we can live by it, knowing all along that one day we will have to stand before God and give an account. God intends for this instruction book to help us. Instead of criticizing God's word, allow his word to judge you and to change you. The Israelites didn't believe God. And so they died in the desert and lost their inheritance. There's a better way. Trust in God's word. Sometimes we don't even know what's in our own hearts. God uses the word to enable us to see the sin and unbelief in our own hearts. The word exposes our hearts. And then if we trust God, the word enables our hearts to obey God and claim his promises. And this is why we must be diligent in reading and applying God's word to our lives. In the Bible, we're allowed to see God. But we are also allowed to see how God sees us. We see ourselves as we really are. This enables us to be honest with God. See, our measuring stick is not our spouse, not our children, not our parents, not another Christian. Our measuring stick is God's word. Are we measuring up? How do we compare with God's word? How do we compare with Jesus Christ? When we spend time in God's word, we know what is expected of us and we see ourselves the way God sees us. Before Joshua conquered Jericho, he went out to survey the situation and he met the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's a very unique appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. In Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, we have that encounter. And Joshua discovered in that encounter that he was second in command. The Lord had a sword in his hand, and Joshua fell at his feet in complete submission. It was that action in private that gave Joshua his public victory. We, too, claim our spiritual inheritance by surrendering to him and trusting his word. We must be aware of an evil heart of unbelief. And yes, this can happen to Christians. That is who the writer of Hebrews was addressing. So in closing, know that Christ is superior to Moses. He is superior just in his person, who he is. He is superior in his ministry. Moses talked about prophecies. He prophesied about what was to come. Christ came and fulfilled those prophecies. But also Christ is superior to Moses in the rest that he offers. And as a matter of fact, he offers three kinds of rest. He offers a day of rest every week. It's called the Lord's Day. We need to seek to follow God's will for our lives on a daily basis and enjoy our inheritance of rest that comes from a relationship with him in knowing that our sins are forgiven and that he will provide for us. It is not only rest, but it is peace in knowing that we're in a relationship with our Lord and Savior. And lastly, we can look forward to our future rest. One day Christ is coming back for his children and he is going to take us to heaven to be with us and for us to be with him forever and ever. And lastly, God gives us his word and it searches our soul. It goes within us and lays everything bare. Nothing is hidden. It is how we know of our standing before God. So I ask you this evening, are you properly utilizing God's purpose and plan for your life? I'm here to tell you if you will do so, it will bring a peace and rest that only God can provide. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage of scripture and I thank you for the gift of the Sabbath day, the seventh day, the Lord's Day, a day set aside where you give us a gift, a gift where we are to worship you and rest. Heavenly Father, forgive us when we don't use that day the way you intend. Heavenly Father, it's sad when you give gifts and we don't accept them. We don't utilize them. Help your children to be different. We live in a day and age where it appears that Sunday is just another day. But it's not supposed to be that way. And help us as your children to set an example and to rest on your day. Heavenly Father, thank you for the peace that comes from a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ, this rest of knowing that you will provide, that you are in control, and we are your children. And then, Heavenly Father, thank you for the final rest, the day we look forward to when we get to go to paradise, a place we call heaven, a perfect place, a place without sin or sickness and death, a place where we will be with you forever. Heavenly Father, thank you for that hope that we have. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Forgive us when we take it for granted and we don't spend time in it each day like you want us to. Help us to read your word. Help us to go to your word not with preconceived notions, but to go to your word to learn to learn more about you, to learn more about ourselves, and to learn what you expect of us. 
Heavenly Father, as we read your word, help us to pause and meditate on it and just listen to what you have to tell us. Heavenly Father, help us to be still and know that you're God. Heavenly Father, thank you for the writer of Hebrews. Thank you for the material that's in this book. May it pierce our hearts. Now, Heavenly Father, be with us this week. Help us to be your hands and your feet. Help us to minister to those that you bring to mind, whether it's through a phone call or a text. Heavenly Father, help us to pray for one another. Help us to be about your business. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I hope you have been honored and glorified. And thank you for hearing this prayer. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.